<clears throat> Welcome, everybody, to this month's DC Oral History Collaborative Coffee Chat. I'm Jasper Collier, the Oral History Project Manager for Humanities DC. And this month, we're pleased to feature an ongoing project from pandemic to protest, Black bartenders in DC. The DC Oral History Collaborative is a citywide initiative of Humanities DC and the DC Public Library aimed at supporting Washington DC's residents in their efforts to document, preserve, and share the stories of the city through oral history. The collaborative offers programs, training, and grants, and maintains an archive of collected oral history interviews in the library's digital collection, Dig DC. Humanities DC is the state humanities council for Washington DC. Our mission is to enrich the quality of life foster intellectual stimulation and promote cross-cultural understanding and appreciation of local history in all neighborhoods of the, District of the District of Columbia through humanities programs and grants. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to note that this morning's program is being recorded for public use. If you do not wish to appear on the recording, please remain off camera or on mute and or on mute. Participants may use the chat box throughout the program to make comments. And at the end of the presentation and moderated conversation, we'll have an opportunity for everyone to ask questions of the panel. Uh, please use the Q&A button to ask these questions or to upvote questions that are being asked by others. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question out loud, please use the raise hand Zoom feature and we'll unmute. So thank you um, to our panelists, our partners, our colleagues at both the DC Public Library and Humanities DC. I'd like to say special thanks to our ASL interpret interpreters, Cheryl Henderson and Rhonda Cunningham. And a special thanks to HDC's programs coordinator, Tracy Mullery for producing this event. And so now I'm pleased to introduce this morning's panelists, Bob Yule, project co-director. Uh, Bob is the executive vice president of Long Story Short Media and a board member of Shaw Main Streets, Inc. He was a former journalist and global health communications specialist. At Long Story Short Media, he creates short form video, podcasts, and written narratives that focus on social impact for nonprofits, NGOs, and corporate social responsibility campaigns. He is a Shaw resident and was a tour guide in Washington, D.C. for over a decade and specializes in public history. He has a background in cocktail history as the co-author of Spirits Sugar Water, uh, Spirits Sugar Water Bitters, How the Cocktail Conquered the World with Derek Brown, owner of the Columbia Room Bar in Shaw. Alex Padro, project co-director. Alex is the executive director of Shaw Main Streets, which he helped found in 2002, where he is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of Shaw's commercial revitalization. Alex is a graduate of New York University and has been a corporate executive in the publishing industry as well as a small business owner. A Shaw resident since 1997, he has served as an advisory neighborhood commissioner since 2001, volunteers on boards for several nonprofits, and advocates for preservation, affordable housing, and the DC public library system. He is a specialist in heritage tourism and the African-American history and landmarks of Shaw and conducts popular historic walking tours of the neighborhood. Laura Elabasunu, uh, the project researcher, Laura is originally from PG County, Maryland and now resides in DC. She is the production assistant with Long Story Short Media. She has a strong interest in storytelling across all forms of media with an emphasis on producing short form content. As a member of Shaw Main Street's DC Oral History Project, she conducts research and interviews and manages project logistics. She's excited to be part of this project and to help elevate underrepresented voices in the community. So thank you all for joining us and now I'll turn it over to you to tell us a little bit more about the project. Thanks, Bob. Awesome, thanks so much, Jasper, I really appreciate it. Thanks to Humanities DC and the DC Oral History Collaborative uh, to give us this opportunity to talk a little bit about our project. And uh, we're going to be sharing the duties here in the presentation. So I'll start off um, giving a little bit of background um, about the project and about um, our topic before I pass it on to Alex and then on to Laura. Um, but uh, first, you know, it's, it's a little early in the morning to talk about cocktails, but uh, I know this is a coffee hour. Um, this is only coffee in my mug. Uh, but I'm hoping people are inspired after this um, 
to sample a little bit of cocktail history, particularly DC's cocktail history and the amazing cocktail bars and bartenders that we have working uh, today. Um, the inspiration for this project, um, it really came from drinking in the bars of Shaw. Um, and so I wanted to tell you a little bit about first about cocktails, um, cocktail history and cocktails in DC in particular. Um, and you know, in DC, we're really lucky because um, over the past decade, we've been living during a cocktail renaissance. So a time period nationally where cocktails are coming back into fashion, um, recovering lost recipes, and DC is really um, part of, in the forefront and a leader in that movement. Um, you know, I think one thing about cocktails, I think people are surprised to learn that cocktails are very much an American invention. Um, so they're as American as jazz, rock and roll, blue jeans, apple pie. Um, they've been around since 1800. Um, so about the same amount of time that Washington DC has been around too. And um, I think as we all know, DC has always been a drinking town. So even in the early days, uh, it was very famous for its bars. Um, many of the early bars were centered around Pennsylvania Avenue, you know, sort of that connecting connector between the Capitol and the White House. Um, there was uh, a few blocks called Rum Row where a lot of these cocktail bars were located early on. Um, the golden age of cocktails and cocktail bars actually was from the Civil War, um, the 1860s up until Prohibition. And um, the term mixologist, you know, you bandy that around today, and I think most people think of it as a very hipster term uh, from the 2000s. That actually dates all the way back to the 1850s. Um, and so in high-end bars around the country, uh, bartenders were called mixologists, and they were pretty much like magicians. Um, they were experts on all different types of exotic um, ingredients. Um, they would set cocktails on fire, something called the uh, blue blazer. Um, and they were experts on everything from, again, you know, culinary and cocktail uh, ingredients to politics, to experts on their city, um, to life in general. And so it was very much an elevated profession. Um, that all came crashing down with prohibition um, in the 1920s. And so this art form was basically declared illegal. And all these beautiful historic bars and some of the dives and saloons, all of them were basically declared illegal and, and were, had, to, um, had to convert to, to non-alcoholic soft drinks um, or clothes. Um, I think one thing that people don't realize was, so last call was January 17th, 1920 um, for prohibition, but it came three years earlier in Washington, DC. Um, that's lack of home rule and Congress wanted to use DC as a test case. And so um, we were shut down three years earlier. Um, of course, I didn't stop drinking at all, as you can imagine, especially with politicians, members of Congress. Um, and in DC, uh, during this time period, there were about 3,000 speakeasies. Um, that's way more than the amount of legal bars that were uh, in DC before prohibition. And uh, there's a great book about that called um, Garrett Peck, um, who's a DC uh, historian. And the book's called How Dry We Weren't. And it's the story of prohibition in DC. Um, but uh, more, you know, prohibition did cut down on people drinking a little bit, but in other, in other ways, it increased the amount of people drinking um, and it increased um, and opened it up to uh, people from all backgrounds and genders. And so um, in DC, uh, particularly U Street in the Black Broadway, um, speakeasies, clubs, jazz clubs were a place where people would mix um, and would, uh, would serve cocktails and, and drink and listen to music. Um, so prohibition lasted for 13 years. Um, so if you think about that, I mean, it's over a decade. Um, in DC, it was over 17 years. So we lost a whole generation of bartenders um, who had to either go abroad or um, find another profession. Um, and so we also lost knowledge about how to make these drinks and what these drinks even were. Um, cocktail, cocktails didn't really come back um, in, in full force until the 1950s and 60s. And we really think about the Mad Men era for that. Um, but then they started to really die out, and um, the 70s, 80s were the really low point for cocktails, um, until the Renaissance started happening in the 1990s. Um, people like Dale DeGroff, uh, he was the mixologist for the Rainbow Room in New York. Um, he literally had to go and find out-of-print cocktail books um, to resurrect some of these recipes, and started making them popular again. And that really spread all across the country. So New York, San Francisco, Chicago, Portland, and DC uh, was one of those really early leaders in um, bringing back cocktails, particularly in the early 2000s. 
Um, so moving into kind of DC history of cocktails, um, DC formed its own bartenders guild in 2008. So there's a national bartenders guild that DC, because we like to do things differently and on our own, um, founded the DC Craft Bartenders Guild. And it was really to help educate bartenders, raise the quality, um, educate drinkers, but really celebrate um, sort of the culture of drinking in DC. So there were bartenders like Derek Brown. Um, he was a, a sommelier at Coney at the time, uh, later went on to found, uh, to open up Columbia Room Bar in Shaw. Uh, Owen Thompson at Bourbon and Adams Morgan, Dan Searing, Looking Glass Lounge, Gina Tersavani, who was at PS7 and Penn Quarter, Chantel Singh at uh, Tabard Inn. Um, so a lot of these leaders sort of joined together to kind of raise the bar, so to speak, for drinking. Um, and all, a lot of these bars really started to open up in Shaw, and Shaw became a center of kind of innovative cocktails. Um, the Columbia Room itself would um, win Best uh, Bar in America in 2018 at Tales of the Cocktail, which is pretty much the Academy Awards, the Oscars of bartending and bars that's held in New Orleans every year. Uh, so, you know, really DC was put on the map. Um, and, you know, one thing that I learned um, that DC was unique about DC cocktail culture was that black bartenders were an integral part of it. Um, they, uh, even during the times of slavery and segregation, uh, black bartenders were leaders in bartending culture. Um, and I didn't really know much about this. And actually the first time I encountered this was at an event in Shaw at the Howard Theater. I know Alex remembers this event in 2013. Um, it was called T DC Toast, uh, a tribute to black bartenders. And um, it talked about these historical figures. Um, the man like Beverly Snow, he had the first um, fine dining restaurant in Washington in the 1930s. Um, it's called the Epicurean restaurant. Uh, a man named Dick Francis, he worked at a bar called Hancock's, which was at 12th in Pennsylvania, and worked there for about 40 years. And um, after the Civil War, he went on to manage the bar in the Senate. Uh, imagine that, the US Senate had a bar back then. And so, and he was the manager of it. Um, and there was even in the 1890s, um, a, uh, a guild for a black mixologists. It was called the DC Blacks Mixo uh, Black Mixologist Club. Um, and R.R. Bowie and J. Burke Edelin uh, were some of the bartenders behind that. Um, and then right up to Prohibition, uh, there's a man named Tom Bullock. Um, he was the first African-American to publish a cocktail book. Um, and I think in the slideshow, you saw his picture along with his book. It's called The Ideal Bartender. Um, I've got a reprinted copy right here. Um, and you can get his original recipes from 1917. Um, so he was not in DC, he was in St. Louis. Um, but the foreword of his book was written by a country club member of where he worked. Um, that man's name was George Herbert Walker. Um, and uh, if that sounds familiar, that's because he's the, um, he was the grandfather of George H.W. Bush. Um, and so there's you know, a DC connection there, um, obviously. Um, and uh, one, the event was organized um, by Derek Brown, by Dave Wondrich, who became sort of the scholar of resurrecting cocktail history, I wrote a very famous book called Imbibe, um, and uh, Dwayne Sylvester. And he is an African-American bartender, um, a member of the Bar DC Craft Bartender Guild, and was really raising the game at Bourbon Steak in Georgetown. And he was one of the stars of the cocktail renaissance in DC. He did a lot of early research and storytelling about the history of black bartenders. And um, he was one of our narrators. And he told the story about how he first learned about this history and, um, and what, um, what he did after with that. And so I think I'm gonna stop now and play our first clip um, from Dwayne Sylvester, um, telling a little bit about um, when he was at Tales of the Cocktail uh, a year before this event at the Howard Theater, um, how he learned about uh, DC's history of black bartenders. Making drinks and putting it out and people are, are putting it in newspapers, that was something that we were accustomed to. And people were asking mm. questions and needed stories and needed to, to know what you were talking about. And one year we were telling stories and actually we were down at Tales of the Cocktail and um, Dave Wondrich came up to me and, and Derek, as it was, mm -hmm. and said, um, you know, Dwayne, I wanted to reach out to you and have a conversation. When he was doing his research, he came across some stories that he didn't tell because he didn't know enough about them. And it wasn't really his place to start telling that story. Apologetically, he was coming to me. So I didn't address it in my book at all. He said, but these stories need to be told. And I said, what are you talking about? 
And he told me, he said, well, did you know that there was a bartender's guild in D.C., a black bartender's guild? And I said, no, I, I had no idea. And we started talking about, you know, the likes of James R. R. Bowie and uh, Edelson and Tom Bullock. And when he said Tom Bullock, it made me scratch my head because I'd been approached by the security guard in my hotel. And he came to me, a guy by the name of Daryl Bullock. And Daryl came to me and said, yo, D, you like this bartending stuff? He said, you know, my uncle wrote a book. I was like, oh, cool. You know, he said, I'm going to bring the book for you. And I was like, all right, great, do that. I'd love to see it. But it was in the hallway conversation. That was probably six weeks prior to me going to Tales and coming back. And I came back. I said, hey, Daryl, your uncle isn't Tom Bullock, is he? Because I saw a picture (laughs) of my Google and and they had a, a similar likeness. He said, yeah, man, I told you, my uncle wrote a book. So I was blown away that this historical figure, there was such close context that this was real. So all of a sudden, that connection in the hallway became so real for me. So Tom Bullock was the first African-American to pen a cocktail book. And that's historic because, you know, people want to say, okay, great, he was the first. Well, he was the first, but his timing was fortunate too because his book was published right when prohibition hit now no good luck for him because you know that sucks you wrote a book now it's illegal to make drinks but it served as a snapshot of american drinking culture thank you one of the things i loved about that um that oral history was you know i had been to this event but i had no idea what had really sparked it um, and the fact that um, the grand nephew of Tom Bullock, who's very famous in, in the cocktail world now, uh, was living in DC and working in Georgetown at the hotel where Bourbon Steak is, um, that, um, that Dwayne just happened to run into. Um, and so, you know, I think that was a really kind of great, kind of great story behind it. And that's what spurred them a year later to have this event at the Howard Theater. And, you know, they serve books, or they serve cocktails from Tom Bullock's book. Um, they had uh, a cocktail called Flower Pot Punch, uh, Flower Pot Punch, which was from Hancock's, which was one of Dick Francis's cocktails. Um, that's a mixture of rum, grenadine, pineapple, lemon and lime. Uh, they're actually was serving that at the Columbia Room not too long ago, and um, it's delicious. Um, so uh, Dwayne really started to work with other Black bartenders to change the perception of bartending um, in D.C. and nationally as something that was historically a white profession, because it wasn't always. Um, He wanted um, younger bartenders to really see themselves in the profession and really recover that lost history. Um, And so he and other bartenders really started recovering these stories. And they're the ones that were telling uh, these histories of black bartenders in the country and in DC. Um, And it led actually to another event. So that was in 2013, 2019, right before the pandemic started, the event that Laura, my colleague and I attended, and it was at the Eaton Bar or Allegory Bar at the Eaton Hotel. And it was all about the history of black bartenders told from contemporary black bartenders. So Dwayne Sylvester was there, a number of other bartenders were there too. um, And they were telling uh, what their inspiration was from the legacy and history in DC, but also their own stories, what what inspired them uh, to get into the craft and their own experiences. And then serving uh, drinks that really told a story, told a historical story or a story about their experiences there. Um, So that really helped spur the idea um, for wanting to capture some of these, um, these histories. I think, you know, in these presentations, they t- talked about how not a lot of primary documentation existed from African-American bartenders in the 1800s, 1900s. Um, you know, a lot of the black newspapers in DC and other cities did a great job of telling these stories, like the, um, uh, like the Washington Bee, for example. And that's where you could find mention of them, but not from their own words. And so, you know, we wanted to help contribute to that historical record uh, by talking to today's bartenders. Um, And then also because uh, Shaw is such a central part of the story in DC, uh, both historically and today, um, I approached uh, Alex Padro. Um, We worked together at Shaw Main Streets and we thought this would be a great project um, for Shaw to help document. Um, It's an important part of the culture. Um, You know, who doesn't want to talk to bartenders and hear from bartenders? Often, you know, nightlife, bars, and restaurants is an important part of our lives, but we look in history, sometimes it gets short shrift. And so capturing that history um, and retelling it um, was was the drive behind this. Um, So I really want to turn it over to Alex now. Um, Alex can talk a little bit about why Shaw was such an important part of this history, Um, a little bit from the history of, you know, the 1920s, 
um, on through the 1960s and then on to today. Well, it's important to uh, talk about how Shaw became a center of African American history and culture and, and population. Uh, you know, during uh, the Civil War, uh, when the neighborhood uh, really uh, began to be developed along 7th and 9th Streets and, and U Streets, uh, there were a series of uh, Union camps uh, that uh, were refuges for escaped slaves. Uh, so from those centers of, of, uh, of population, uh, a number of different institutions were established uh, to support the African-American community uh, that uh, remained in the city. Uh, so you had institutions like Howard University, uh, you know, public schools, uh, you know, churches, um, and, uh, and social organizations. Uh, and uh, so it was only natural uh, that you know, entertainment become part of, of the mix there. Uh, it's also very important to remember that Washington was a segregated city. And uh, there were uh, very many areas of the city where African-Americans were not able to own property. And as a result, uh, African-Americans were very densely uh, populated uh, from a residential perspective in what we now know as Shaw, south of, uh, of Florida Avenue, which was originally Boundary Street. Um, and um, uh, you know, many people are familiar with the term Black Broadway, uh, but there was also a Black Wall Street uh, and, uh, it, um, you know, the Shaw neighborhood, uh, also sometimes referred to as, as Uptown uh, uh, along U Street uh, or uh, Mid City, uh, south of, uh, of U Street, uh, were uh, a center for African American history, culture, and business and entertainment for the entire metropolitan region, not just for the city of Washington. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, as, uh, as entertainment, uh, continued to uh, evolve and as, as the neighborhood uh, was fully uh, built out, uh, it uh, became a, a go-to uh, for, for bars, restaurants, and then when theaters uh, were established uh, you know, for that type of entertainment. Uh, so we still have a number of uh, the significant landmarks uh, related to the, the, the heyday of, uh, of, uh, of the Black Broadway. Uh, so the Howard Theater now has been restored and is an integral part uh, you know, of the city's uh, entertainment uh, uh, offerings. Uh, the, the Lincoln Theater uh, is also still in operation. Uh, some of the buildings that housed uh, theaters like uh, the Dunbar are no longer uh, in their original uses, but uh, still contribute to the historic fabric of the neighborhood. Uh, uh, there, all, all along these, these major streets uh, were a significant number of bars and restaurants. And uh, although uh, many of them were owned and operated uh, by African-Americans, uh, you have to remember that uh, discrimination uh, really uh, and segregation uh, really uh, were in some cases not a two-way street. So while African-Americans could not go downtown uh, to theaters, bars, and nightclubs uh, that uh, were uh, white owned and for, uh, for white customers, uh, all types of patrons could come to uh, the black owned and operated businesses uh, in Shaw. So in, in many cases, uh, you know, there were outstanding uh, you know, performers, uh, for example, and also uh, mixologists that uh, the people of all uh, classes uh, and all races, you know, flocked to the neighborhood uh, to be able to take advantage of. And, uh, you know, Bob is going to talk about, you know, some of the, the notable ones uh, in the 1920s, uh, but uh, probably uh, the best known uh, is uh, you know, the Cavern Club or the Crystal Caverns or the Bohemian Caverns. Uh, just because of, uh, in the, the basement of that building, which is, is still, uh, you know, uh, extant uh, at uh, 11th and, uh, and U Streets, uh, uh, which uh, today has on the first floor the uh, Harlot uh, Bar and, uh, and Restaurant, had a, a very unusual uh, decor with uh, stalactites and stalagmites as you know, phony ones as part of, uh, of the uh, the decor there. And as a result, uh, even though uh, um, through a number of different iterations and names and, and ownership, uh, you know, it, it, it was, uh, you know, internationally uh, recognized, uh, as were uh, some of the other uh, less notable uh, venues. So, uh, but uh, places that, uh, that, that were in buildings that uh, still are excellent, uh, for example, you know, Key's Restaurant, uh, just off uh, the intersection of, uh, of 7th and T, uh, was another popular destination. Uh, while you know, we, we don't know as much about uh, the, the speakeasies uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, predominated uh, in the neighborhood uh, during uh, segregation. Uh, you know, when uh, I 
Uh, we talk about uh, the neighborhood's revitalization in more recent years, there has been a speakeasy boom. And, and suddenly uh, we have uh, speakeasies uh, almost on every block. But uh, staying with uh, the historical uh, patterns, uh, uh, the, the density of African-American uh, businesses and, uh, uh, and residents uh, started to ebb after a 1947 Supreme Court uh, decision that uh, made restrictive covenants uh, illegal. So folks that could afford to move out of the neighborhood did to other parts of the city, which uh, were uh, considered you know, uh, streetcar suburbs and, the, and even uh, you know, beyond the, the District of Columbia. Uh, you know, transportation patterns, uh, you know, also changed uh, the reliance on the streetcars, which was how everybody got to the neighborhood back in the day, uh, you know, uh, was not as uh, predominant as more and more people had cars and you know, more bus lines. So, you know, people didn't necessarily have to come to the neighborhood to be able to, uh, to get their drink on, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, still uh, there were a significant number of, uh, of uh, clubs and uh, uh, and restaurants uh, in the area, and uh, and then there were some uh, some uh, rather notable ones that, that, that did again get national press. So uh, Cecilia's is a great uh, example of that. So uh, Cecilia's actually uh, started behind uh, the Lincoln Theater, uh, and then uh, subsequently moved to uh, Wilfberger and uh, T Street. Uh, and uh, the building uh, that housed uh, Cecilia's uh, is still excellent. It's been incorporated into the the Shaw. Uh, a residential building now, uh, but uh, so we're in the process of, of honoring uh, Cecilia Scott, uh, the owner. We're gonna be actually installing a plaque uh, in, in her memory and talking about her contributions uh, as, a, as a woman entrepreneur and a bar owner um, you know, on the, uh, the uh, Ulberger Street side uh, of that building uh, coming up next month. And uh, then uh, on, on the corner of that, that same block uh, there in Wilberger at an alley, uh, the all sports club that was uh, owned by Joe and, and May Heard is also gonna get recognition. Uh, we're actually gonna be naming ceremonially uh, the alley that was there at the corner where um, of the building that held uh, the club uh, used to stand uh, is uh, being introduced in the city council and, and hopefully before too long there'll be a sign uh, along with a sign that has been installed now that says Cecilia's Way, uh, ceremonially naming Wilberger Street. Uh, so uh, we're, we're continuing to, to rediscover and to, uh, to bring to the light of day uh, some of the wonderful history of black bartenders and black clubs and restaurants. So uh, you know, um, uh, in addition to some of the other factors that I mentioned uh, about uh, you know, population uh, changes and changes in businesses, the 1960 riots were, were devastating uh, to uh, a number of uh, African-American neighborhoods in the city and, uh, and Shaw was certainly one of them. Uh, so uh, there are still empty lots along uh, 7th Street uh, that uh, uh, were the result of the rioting that took place following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in April of 1968. And uh, it also uh, led to, uh, to many of the, the businesses that, that were damaged uh, by the riots never reopening. Uh, so uh, there had been uh, several decades, you know, uh, from the 70s to the 80s to the early 90s, when uh, really, if, uh, if you were coming to Shaw and you didn't live in Shaw or have another uh, have relatives or another reason to be coming to the neighborhood, the only reason you came to Shaw was to by drugs and sex, uh, not for cocktails, unfortunately, uh, because there weren't that many places that you, you could go. We still have liquor stores, uh, but uh, but not very many of uh, the nightclubs uh, managed to survive over, over the decades. Uh, but that all changed uh, after the city decided to, to build uh, the new convention center uh, in the market square. And uh, property values dram dramatically started increasing people uh, realized uh, the opportunities to try to uh, restore some historic buildings in the neighborhood and to reestablish uh, the wonderful you know, food and drink culture that existed in previous decades. And so, you know, Shawmain Street's played an important role in that because we, we surveyed uh, community residents and visitors and found out that um, top priority they wanted to see in terms of, uh, of businesses uh, being brought back to the neighborhood were bars and restaurants. So, um, before too long, uh, you know, uh, some of these uh, very uh, uh, economically uh, priced uh, retail spaces became uh, very uh, attractive places for, for small bars uh, and, uh, 
and restaurants and arts uses. And uh, one of the first uh, you know, was uh, the advent of uh, the passenger bar on the um, uh, 1000 uh, block of 7th Street. So uh, the passenger bar uh, was started by uh, uh, Tom and Derek Brown. And uh, there was actually a back room uh, in uh, uh, the passenger, uh, which was the original Columbia room. And from that back room, uh, you know, spawned, uh, as Bob mentioned, uh, you know, an internationally recognized uh, Columbia room, which is located in a historic uh, building that was expanded in, in Blackman Alley. Uh, you know, but that really uh, you know, signaled a, a, a shift in terms of uh, the attention of, of the city uh, regarding uh, cocktail culture. All of a sudden, everybody wanted to be in show with, with restaurants and bars. And uh, before long, uh, we even had our first microbrewery in the neighborhood, right? Proper Brewing, uh, opened in what used to be uh, uh, a pool hall that uh, Duke Ellington uh, had uh, frequented and uh, where he had learned uh, or been exposed to uh, uh, the option of uh, becoming a professional uh, musician uh, back in the, the late teens and early 1920s. Uh, so uh, it's a, a real operating uh, microbrew uh, pub uh, and uh, a restaurant that now has uh, spawned a, a separate uh, you know, brewing facility uh, elsewhere in, in the city, and you can get right proper uh, beers, uh, you know, uh, at retail. Uh, so we've got, and uh, uh, also part of, uh, of the evolution was uh, a series of specialty bars for a very specific types of, uh, of uh, spirits. So for example, uh, Mockingbird Hill uh, was, as far as I can tell, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, bar in America uh, focused on sherry. So Chantal Seng, uh, you know, uh, was uh, the inspiration uh, for uh, creating a sherry bar, uh, which uh, was one of three bars uh, that, uh, that uh, Derek Barr Brown brought to uh, the 1800 block of 7th Street uh, when uh, the Progression Place development uh, revitalized uh, the, the east side of that particular block. Uh, and then uh, we uh, more recently uh, had uh, Espita, uh, which is a mezcal driven uh, restaurant uh, at, uh, at Ninth and End Streets uh, Northwest uh, that, uh, uh, that helped to introduce many people in, in Washington to uh, Mexican spirit that they weren't familiar with. Everybody knew about tequila, but very few people knew about the uh, So, um, you know, fast forward to today, uh, you know, Shaw is an internationally uh, recognized destination for, uh, for nightlife uh, and entertainment. Uh, people from all over the world, uh, when they come to Washington, come here to eat and to drink. And uh, you know, we have uh, fantastic uh, uh, you know, bars uh, that have gotten a great recognition, like Service Bar uh, on the 900 block of, of U Street, uh, which now has uh, spawned uh, uh, some, uh, some new businesses that will be opening uh, in Blackton Alley uh, from the same owners uh, very shortly. Uh, and even uh, you know through the, the pandemic, uh, we continue to see uh, you know new openings uh, in, in bars and restaurants in the neighborhood, and uh, uh, Ramy Awards uh, galore, uh, you know uh, recognizing uh, all types of, uh, of, uh, of bars uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, and I'll and I'll, and I'll just uh, close uh, this section uh, by mentioning that although we have some, some wonderful you know high end. Uh, you know, uh, bars where uh, mixologists are, are practicing uh, their crafts. We also have dive bars, and dive bars are also very popular. Uh, so Ivy and Coney is probably uh, the exemplar of our dive bar, uh, which uh, is on the 1500 block of uh, 7th Street, uh, in, a, in a space uh, that uh, has been uh, expanded because it became so popular. It's, uh, it, its theme is uh, Detroit and uh, Chicago sports, uh, but uh, so, uh, they don't. They have very few, you know, cocktail options. Uh, they're uh, primarily uh, you know, beer and, and shot driven, uh, you know. Uh, but, but nonetheless, uh, it, it's a demonstration of the diversity uh, that we have in terms of uh, our bars. So uh, back to Bob now to uh, talk more about uh, more about how some of our uh, current uh, mixologists uh, became bartenders. Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> So we, you know, we wanted to give you just a little bit about that background of cocktails and that um, in Shaw and then the cocktail renaissance in DC. Um, so we wanted to dive in now to um, talking to our narrators. And 
Uh, so the African-American bartending community in Shaw, where they got their start, you know, how they were part of this re of revolution um, and help leading the Renaissance and cocktails. Um, and, you know, we found a lot of unexpected things. Um, you know, one of them, you know, one theme that went along uh, across all of our, or many of our narrators is that many of them did get their start in the restaurant industry in the hospitality and service industry um, at uh, chain restaurants. Um, and, you know, everything from TGIF uh, to McCormick and Schmick's here. And before there were high-end cocktail bars, this is where you could really practice your craft to learn how to be a bartender, to learn those skill sets. Um, and actually TGIF um, was responsible for training a whole generation of bartenders that uh, went on to become very renowned uh, mixologists after that. I think it's a fact that not many people know. And of course, McCormick and Schmick's had a big presence in DC too. A lot of people mentioned founding farmers um, as kind of a sort of revolutionary restaurant and bar program in DC um, that um, got them exposed to uh, different ingredients, fresh ingredients, different um, classic cocktails. Um, farmers, fishers, and bakers in Georgetown as well. Um, so there was, you know, good cohort of our bartenders that got their start that way. Um, and then there were some that completely shifted careers. Um, so one of our narrators, Al Thompson, um, he works at Tip Cow Restaurant in Columbia Heights. Um, he was a law student um, and stressed out by law school. And uh, he was going to bars a lot and thought, you know, well, how can I stop spending money on bars? Maybe if I work on bar in bars. Um, but he found he was really um, energized by it and more energized than he was by law school. And so uh, he quit, lo quit law school and became a bartender and quickly, you know, really rose through the ranks of bartending. Um, he had to convince his parents uh, that that was a good decision. <laughs> and uh, that was also a theme that popped up in many of our interviews. Um, and, and as uh, our bartenders started finding success, you know, convincing their parents, this was, this was a profession. Um, Glendon Hartley um, of Service Bar that um, Alex mentioned on uh, U Street, he was a fashion designer in New York, um, originally from Maryland, uh, but he came back to DC and he apprenticed with a mixologist here, and he brought an artistic lens to cocktails, and that's how he pursued his, his creativity and passion. And as uh, Alex mentioned, um, he's, uh, he went, went on to uh, specialize in Pisco and Peruvian food. And that's sort of well, the new restaurant, um, a new concept that'd be opening up in Black Denali. Um, so he took, you know, found a, a real passion for a different cultural culinary um, and uh, cocktail uh, culture there. Um, and then one of our narrators, Lauren, Palin, Lauren Paler, um, Lauren was in nursing school and she used to do her homework in the bars and shop. Uh, and that's where she got exposed to uh, the cocktail renaissance there. And um, so she um, quit nursing school and quit nursing to, um, to become a bartender and a really well-known bartender today. Uh, so we have a clip from Lauren Paler as one of our narrators. So uh, let's hear from her. And I didn't really know what I was getting myself into, but I knew there was something that I liked about the food and beverage industry. And uh, I'd say after two or three months, I like cold turkey quit my job. And my mom was so mad at me. She was so mad. She's like, I don't understand. You quit nursing to be a bartender? And I was like, yeah, I'm going to be a bartender. And I'm going to do this as a career. And it's going to be amazing. So I knew very early on that I wanted to pursue it as a career. My parents, I imagine, you know, where I grew up in the Bronx, their image was very much what we see on television, right? Pouring shots and beers. And it was really like interesting because I was trying to explain to them at the time, like, you know, there are different styles of bartending, just like there are different types of lawyers and just like there are different types of doctors. And, you know, what I, I want to do is really learn these stories about the spirit, about the cocktails and be able to integrate them into the way that I, you know, interact with my guests. You know, there's this aspect of service and hospitality that goes in conjunction with this. There's so much more to it than just making drinks. And initially, my parents were very dismissive and, you know, they just didn't understand. But I also don't think I really at the time had a full understanding of what to expect or what I was getting myself into. Because what I thought bartending was and what I was seeing were two completely different things. And um, it's really quite ironic because I do recall myself at a very young age being like, oh, I would I would never work in hospitality. I didn't think it was beneath me. I just was like, I'm not interested in that. 
And again, I think it was just because I didn't know. But when I saw those bartenders bartending at the passenger and the Columbia room, there was just something inside of me that, you know, the same way I think people look at chefs and they're just so blown away. I was just blown away. So interestingly enough, there were a lot of things from nursing that I realized I brought into bartending. And I had to really think about what it was that I loved so much about bartending because I loved nursing, but I think going into work every day, I was just really sad. It was long hours. I was always, you know, obviously speaking with people. I was learning. I was educating them. And a lot of those components exist in food and beverage. I think what I realized about food and beverage is I had the ability to be creative. There was a creative outlet that I was lacking in nursing. And for me, I think I really was able to take those facts and the knowledge and the stories and integrate a really unique experience for every guest that came into the bar. And it was genuine. And I think that's what made it fun for me. But I think that's also what made it resonate so much with the guests that came in. Yeah, and, and we loved hearing about how, you know, nursing, uh, the skill sets of nursing could come into bartending, something that you don't always think about. Um, but uh, Lauren got her start in the Derek Brown bars on the Passenger Columbia Room and the ones on 7th Street. Um, and uh, went on to run her own bar programs and is award-winning mixologist now. And she's uh, working now at Silver Lion, which uh, was founded by a London-based uh, mixologist who uh, won best cocktail bar in the world in, um, out of this bar in London. And then they opened up Silver Lion right before the pandemic started in uh, the Riggs building uh, downtown. But um, so, um, you know, she talked, Lauren talked a lot about um, her mentors as well in the bartending community and how close-knit um, the bartending community is, particularly for Black bartenders. And so I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Laura, now, uh, who's going to talk about what that community looks like and what we heard from our, our interviews and narrators there. Hi. Um, so like Bob mentioned, a lot of our narrator, narrators described that the local bartending community in D.C. is very tight-knit. There's a strong sense of collaboration. And in the next clip that you'll hear from Glendon Hartley, who works at Service Bar on U Street, you'll hear about that sense of collaboration and how it helped him and other people start viewing bartending as a desirable, desirable profession. I think, you know, we, I think, you know, we, to be in this industry, I think it takes a certain amount of, uh, you know, bravado um, and a certain amount of, uh, you know, humble, um, humbleness, um, if you will. And the fact that, you know, a lot of bartenders that are coming up in this industry are people of color, whether you're black or brown or whatever you are. Um, I think that the reason that our uh, African-American bartending community in DC um, is so close knit is because we all came up at a time where we were trying to learn this, this thing. And um, if you're a, a black man or a woman in America, you know that you always have to be better than anyone else that's doing it just so you can get recognized for doing that, that same thing. Uh, so I feel like a lot of our, you know, community has, um, just tried to lift each other up as we went along. So if I learn this, you learn this. Um, and Dwayne and I go back and forth on, you know, our cocktails and have you read this? Have you done this? Have you seen this? Did you go here? Did you go here? So um, we are always about educating ourselves, but you know, the whole community. And I think a lot of us are in a position now where we're actually educators. And um, that's why, you know, the, the new Black bartender community, the Black Mixologist Club in DC, um, is so progressive. Is because you know we all learned by lifting each other up and lifting all the bartenders in the city up. And uh, I think that's why we're such a close knit community. I think that is the purpose of what you know we and they are trying to do. So uh, I think that 
we didn't really have an interest in doing this job before for the last, I want to say like 50 to, you know, 60 years because, you know, it really wasn't a job that was going to get us anywhere in life for lack of a better, <laughs> for lack of a better statement. Um, because we, you know, if you're a, an African American child growing up in America, your family wants you to be a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, something that will gain you prestige and a lot of money. Um, but no one actually saw bartending as being that until, you know, the Renaissance happened and we are a wealth of knowledge and history as well as spirits and, you know, um, customer service, just, um, just, you know, regular human interaction. Um, that's what a bartender is. That's what a mixologist always was. They're a person that had a lot of knowledge on every subject that you can actually throw at them. Um, and people don't understand that. I didn't have any black or brown women. Um, so in that same vein of like lifting each other up, of educating not only ourselves, but the community was also mentioned by Andra Johnson or AJ. And she helped found Black DMV Restaurant Week. And it's a organization that showcases black owned bars and restaurants, not only during DMV Black Restaurant Week, but throughout the year. And Andra herself, she's been working in the industry since before she could drink. She started as a server at Chili's um, and has worked her way up and around almost all positions at like restaurants and bars. And she's, she's also led her own bar at Macon Restaurant and she's now at Serenata in Union Market. Um, and in addition to working in the industry, she's also definitely educated herself a lot on the history of Black bartending in D.C. and Black bars across D.C. And she actually did a lecture at the Allegory Bar at Eden um, that was called The Beginnings of Black Drinking Culture in D.C. So she is taking that knowledge and sharing it with the community. Um, and she also is writing a book or is in the midst of writing a book called White Plates, Black Faces that focuses on the Black culinary talent in the industry and those opportunities and experiences. And in addition to Andra, we also talked to Capri Robinson. She's also been working in the industry for a while and she was crowned DC Cocktail Queen in 2017. And she was one of the, she was the first African-American cocktail queen. And she described how entering that competition, her experiences in that competition and after opened doors for her in the industry, not only in terms of networking, but in, in seeing the possibilities and options for black women in the industry. And having gotten that far, it's, it's led her to pursuing even more. She's co-founded a nonprofit called Chocolate City's Best, which is a different kind of cocktail competition that fosters the community even more. And in this clip, you'll hear more about why Chocolate City's Best is different and what it does to elevate the Black bartending community in DC. didn't have any black or brown women who were mentors at all and I didn't see many either you know just in the industry when I was kind of getting to this my journey to Chalk City's best is because after winning the competition and different things like that I was able to get into opportunities like going to distillery tours for free and, and you know being able to travel to cocktail conferences and different things like that and not seeing me or seeing people that look like me. And it was just like, ah, there's a lot more of us, you know, doing this, especially in DC. So our first Chalk City's Best competition, it was one day, you know, this is how I thought I wanted my competition to work. This first competition was, it was one day. Um, we had online submissions and through the online submissions, me and Mike went through all of the submissions blindly we read their recipes um read their stories and for so chuck city's best competition is more about the story than it is a cocktail it's not about who what brand that we're using or anything like that it's more about what was your experience in the industry it could be a good experience where you know doors have always opened for you it could be 
I've gotten nowhere that I wanted to be because I'm a black or brown person. It could be, I like where I'm at, but I also want to learn more. You know, like it could be anything. Um, so we were looking for stories that are compelling and then seeing how they connected it to a cocktail, you know? So you use these ingredients because of this. So um, that first competition, <laughs> how we had it laid out was so different. It was one, there was a people's choice area and then there was the top six, which were judged by judges and they won the grand prize. And I mean, we had a great time. It was, we had a DJ, we've had the DJ six. <laughs> the winner of the top six, uh, they got to go to Tales of the Cocktail with us next year. And um, that was Dedea Jones, who is now our content curator. Um, and she did an awesome cocktail called Black Sheep. And um, her story was compelling. You know, she was like, I am in this world. I love this world. But I feel like the Black Sheep when I'm working at a bar, when I'm out at events, um, you know, I'm not seen, I'm not really heard. And then she did a beautiful cocktail with like uh, Santa Teresa rum, Cabernet syrup. It was really delicious. It was almost like a, a Manhattan style um, with rum. It was so good. Um, and these cherries that she had cured. So there really is a strong sense of community in the DC, in, in, in DC, in terms of being black, working in the restaurants, working at bars. And I think the pandemic really elevated that community in terms of support from each other and the, and the rest of the DC community. And so now I'm gonna pass it off to Alex to talk more about how the pandemic impacted bartenders and bars in Shaw. So uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic unfortunately has a had a, a devastating effect on uh, bars and restaurants uh, in Shaw uh, over uh, the, the course of, uh, of the health emergency that uh, started in March of 2020. We actually had 16 closures. Um, and uh, that's been a combination of establishments that have been around uh, for a number of years and then were facing um, lease renewals uh, in the midst of the pandemic and you know, not knowing how long this was gonna go on. And, and what the prospects were going to be, uh, you know, combined with uh, the inability of many of these businesses to access any of the, the local or federal funding uh, that was available to support, uh, you know, bars and restaurants, uh, you know, just made it uh, unfortunately impossible for, for a number of them to be able to survive. It's important to remember uh, that uh, initially, uh, you know, bars uh, were closed completely, they had no capacity uh, unless uh, you know, they were also restaurants of, of serving any customers at all because no one was allowed to, to go in. They were not allowed to have any customers, customers in the premise. So uh, one of the things that uh, the innovations that uh, was, uh, was arrived upon was to uh, look at the opportunity to have to-go uh, cocktails uh, as an option. And um, in a city that has a, a very you know, uh, strong, uh, legal, uh, you know, uh, you know, process uh, for the licensing uh, of alcohol. Uh, you know, this was was not an easy thing to to arrive at. Uh, but uh, gratefully, uh, you know, uh, the DC Council, uh, you know, uh, saw the necessity of, uh, of of providing this option so that uh, the entire class of businesses uh, in the city could be able to try to survive. And then Avra figured out, you know, how to uh, to make it work. And ultimately, uh, you know, the, the process was, was very simple uh, uh, and uh, you know, the rules were, were not that uh, contemplated, uh, complicated. Uh, in many cases, it, it was mostly, the challenge was mostly figuring out, you know, how to package uh, the cocktails so that they could be, you know, transported, you know, from, uh, the, uh, from the bar to uh, an individual's uh, residences to be able to, to consume it. Uh, so uh, uh, I guess one of the, the more innovative uh, approaches was uh, the cocktail pouch. Uh, well, everyone uh, was familiar with uh, juice pouches. That was a pretty common type of, uh, of packaging that uh, most uh, people uh, had in their homes. Uh, but uh, uh, one of the first to actually uh, apply that to, to cocktails uh, was a uh, uh, capo, 
Uh, so uh, uh, Capo is uh, on, uh, on the front uh, on the, the uh, 700 block of, uh, of Florida Avenue, an Italian uh, deli uh, selling sandwiches and uh, pasta salad and uh, pasta dishes. Uh, but uh, what most people uh, that aren't in the know don't realize is uh, at, the, at the rear of the space, uh, there is what, what appears to be uh, a door to, uh, to uh, cold storage. Uh, and when you open that door, it's actually a speakeasy. Uh, uh, so uh, they actually came up uh, with uh, something that they called the Fauci pouch, uh, named for Dr. Dr. Anthony uh, Fauci from uh, the National Institutes of Health, and he's obviously you know, on the, the news, uh, it seems like every hour on the hour talking about, uh, you know, uh, the latest, uh, you know, uh, progress and challenges related to uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, but they, they actually, you know, put uh, Dr. Fauci's image on uh, these uh, pouches and, uh, and came up with a, a variety of different uh, cocktails uh, to go uh, that uh, got uh, national and even international uh, media attention. Uh, um, folks at uh, Calico and Blagden Alley also uh, were offering uh, pouches. Uh, but uh, just about every uh, bar in the neighborhood had uh, some kind of sealable uh, uh, bottles uh, for uh, their, uh, their cocktails. And, uh, and some restaurants had really hadn't focused on uh, their cocktails in the past, all of a sudden realized that, that this was an opportunity for them to, to generate additional revenue. So, uh, so some of these bars, uh, uh, until it was possible to actually see customers inside, uh, you know, uh, were able to uh, start generating as much as 20% of uh, their, their previous sales, uh, you know, through uh, takeout uh, cocktails. Uh, others uh, uh, re uh, reached as much as 40% of their sales. And uh, it really uh, was something that hopefully will, will be able to be continued even after the pandemic is over. And number of the, the pivots uh, that the district government uh, was able to, uh, to facilitate was uh, the establishment of parklets and streeteries. Uh, that's uh, uh, the uh, creation of, of outdoor spaces, uh, usually uh, where parking spaces uh, formerly uh, were uh, in the street, uh, where uh, either covered or uncovered uh, seating uh, could be established uh, where uh, bars and restaurants could, could serve uh, patrons safely. Uh, so uh, that has actually uh, you know, taken off dramatically. And in, in Shaw, we have nine different uh, bars and restaurants that, that have uh, uh, parklets. Uh, if, uh, if more than one uh, business is, is utilizing the seating, it's called a streetery. Uh, otherwise, if it's an individual business, it's called a parklet. Uh, and uh, we actually uh, pioneered the first alley streetery uh, in the city in Blackman Alley. So uh, we had uh, Tiger Fork, uh, the Columbia Room, uh, the Dabney, and Lost and Found all participating uh, in, uh, in that uh, use of shared space uh, in the alley, uh, which uh, has become incredibly popular and it was really a lifesaver uh, for uh, those businesses in that, that period before uh, they were able to allow customers inside the doors. So, uh, you know, uh, smart operators, uh, uh, even have uh, been able to, uh, you know, look at uh, additional ways of pivoting. Uh, uh, coffee shops like the Roasted Boom that opened uh, after the, uh, the beginning of the health emergency uh, pivoted to also uh, become a wine bar in addition to being uh, a coffee bar over at uh, 11th and Rhode Island. And uh, folks uh, like uh, Brent Kroll, uh, noted uh, sommelier uh, that uh, had started Maxwell at, uh, at 9th and uh, o streets uh, before the pandemic started uh, even uh, was able to expand uh, to the, the navy yard uh, and also added uh, a parklet at a, at a show location so uh, we also had uh, additional you know bars and restaurants opening uh, in the midst of the pandemic and, and there are, are more in the works uh, so uh, uh, yardbird uh, is one of the of the notable openings over at new york and ninth uh, that's a, a national chain uh, but uh, and very well known uh, for its cocktail program. And, and also Trulux, a seafood restaurant that's also a chain uh, in the South, uh, opened over at, uh, at 7th and, and K Streets. Uh, but uh, there, there are more uh, on the way. Uh, Oyster Oyster uh, was one of the biggest uh, openings that we had 
uh, in the city and uh, just got a rave review uh, in uh, uh, the Washington Post uh, by their food critic, uh, Tom uh, Sietzma, saying it's uh, one of the, the best places to, to eat in Washington today. So, uh, and they've got you know, a great cocktail program uh, there as well. So even in the midst of the pandemic, even though we've had you know, a, a number of uh, unfortunate uh, closures, we've got new places uh, opening uh, that are very much cocktail and, uh, and uh, beverage forward. Uh, Batro uh, Italian Osteria just opened in the form of Bistro OM space. So we lost you know, uh, one great uh, space uh, and uh, one great uh, you know, restaurant and bar and uh, placed it uh, uh, with another. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, very soon uh, we'll, we'll see the, the Howard Theater reopen uh, once again and, uh, uh, and, uh, and we'll continue to see pivots uh, like uh, the folks at Half Smoke that took over an empty lot in front of the Howard Theater uh, and uh, most recently turned it into a rosé garden uh, for the summer. So uh, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And, uh, and many of these uh, you know, mixologists and business owners, many of them African-Americans are, are finding a way to be able to, uh, to help to, uh, to sustain and uh, to, uh, to thrive, uh, even though uh, these are not the best of uh, circumstances. Obviously, everyone is looking forward to another uh, a DMV Black Restaurant Week coming up. So uh, we'll, I'll pass this uh, back to uh, Bob to talk about how bartenders experience the pandemic. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, and I think it was a, we found a mixture of that extreme hardship that our narrators um, had to experience. Um, suddenly, they were at home. They it was not legal to have their bars open. Um, also, um, innovation and pivoting too, uh, that really shined through that people had to decide what to do next. And um, usually after a period of, you know, of sleeping in and spending a few weeks decompressing, um, a lot of them went, you know, went to work and finding what would be the next opportunity. Um, the pandemic was something that affected our project. Um, you know, we really started this in March of 2020. Um, right when everything started to shut down. And so suddenly our narrators, um, everything was uncertain. And uh, so we, we stopped down a little bit as well to see how things would develop because we figured that this was a really important historical moment. And the lens of bartenders, particularly black bartenders in DC was a great way to, to document that. The, uh, something that historians would be interested in, you know, hundreds from years from now. Um, and so the next clip is from one of our um, narrators, Al Thompson uh, from Kiptow, and he talks about what he thought in March when things started shutting down. So we can cue that with Al Thompson. So, oh, we'll be back in a few months. Like I thought it was gonna last like two months. Like by May, we'll be fine. We'll go back. It's fine. Everyone's overreacting. Why is everyone making it such a big deal? And then the longer it went on, like, okay, this is obviously, we're gonna be here for a while. So just hunker down, adapt, because I mean, in anything in life, you have to adapt to succeed. No matter what you're doing, if it's deal with your, your current circumstance, your current situation, and adapt to met the most of it. Like May, I was like, okay, it's May, we're still doing this, we're probably gonna be doing this for a while, no one's wearing their mask, no one's doing what we're supposed to be doing. Hashtag America is what we do, we do whatever we want. So it's probably gonna be a while, so how do we change? How can we, you know, figure this out? Then you start thinking about, okay, what do I do? Like, what can I do that will appeal to people that can still have fun, still do what I know how to do best, and still like, you know, be successful. So we start batting ideas and then you start trying them. Hopefully they work. I'm lucky that we weren't closed that long, at least here at TipCal. Like we were closed for two months and some change. We came back like the middle of May, early June, and we've been open since then. But I'd said like when we first started to hear about coronavirus, that once it gets here, when and if it comes here, we're going to be the worst country because we're so stubborn. Everyone is so gung-ho about things. And so I have rights. I have these freedoms. I know what I'm talking about. Those other places are stupid. This is how we are as Americans. I know that we're from America. I know this is what it is. So I knew this would happen. I'm sad that it happened, but I wasn't wrong. So I kind of foresaw it coming, but it's frustrating because like after a while, you're like, you know what to do. Just do it. You know, if we can just be patient, we could be better, but we don't have patience. So here we are. 
you know, I, we kind of felt that words of wisdom from a bartender who understands human nature better than a bartender. And, you know, uh, particularly seeing the resistance to masking and other things that, you know, he's something he could very much anticipate with his um, position in, uh, um, in the hospitality industry. Um, but we did, and, you know, one thing that uh, interview was done on um, the patio uh, for Tip Cow. Um, they were lucky enough to have patio space up in Columbia Heights. Um, and so that's why you hear some of the sirens in the background, but that was the best place we, we could do our interview with him as, you know, he was, Al Thompson still working and kind of hustling. Um, but that pivot was, it went everything from online classes, the to-go cocktails, they had to discover how to suddenly, you're wearing a mask, you can't interact with your customers, they can't see you make the cocktails, how do you pivot? And so there was a lot of discussion about that. Um, I think uh, Mimi Evans, Mimi Evans was one of our, um, narrators who was a bartending instructor at Maryland Bartending School. She also had her own events business, Mixin, uh, Mixin Mimi Mixology. All events were canceled. She had huge events coming up before the pandemic and everything stopped. Um, one thing that she did, uh, she started her own um, lemonade company and she called it Life Gives You Lemons. Um, organic, vegan-friendly, handcrafted lemonades that uh, caught on and were being sold to businesses around uh, the city. So another kind of pivot even away from alcohol into something different. Imagine Bob and I are in the middle of the uh, webinar for the Humanities Council. Oh, shit. I think I need a cool Alex, you're not on mute. <laughs> and so I'm going to switch now to, um, you know, one of the other unexpected things that we had here uh, were the protests um, for the period of racial reckoning, um, social and racial justice protests. And um, Laura is going to talk a little bit about how that affected our narrator. So many of our narrators were really honest with us in discussing their feelings of uncertainty and sadness and, and burnout last year. I mean, they were exhausted and processing that grief in all its forms, like while simultaneously trying to figure out what to do professionally when everything shut down, that was a very confusing and, and, and hard taxing time for them. But it, it did also reinforce the true meaning of self-care and caring for community through like rest and actually taking steps towards what you can do while also taking care of yourself. Um, so they had to figure out what they were capable of doing and how to support people when you can't physically, <laughs> physically be there to support. Um, so there was a strong sense of collaboration. Um, there was a Buy Black movement that reinforced like buying directly from black businesses. Um, there were lots of liquor brands that were focusing on highlighting the black bartenders in the industry. And what I found interesting, especially in our most recent interviews, or our most recent interviews with narrators is that they discussed that that support has, has grown, but it also kind of tapers off a bit, especially now that we're entering into the fall of 2021, they have noted that like, it's not as strong as it was last year. And they're trying to figure out what they can do to build that back up for them, their local community, but also like nationally. Um, and a lot of the black bartenders did become more of activists in the past year or so. Um, they became more vocal about the racism and inequalities in the industry. And, and how things have not been okay for a very long time. And in addition to that, trying to figure out what their next steps would be, a lot of people shifted into founding these nonprofits to help address these issues, and especially to support um, Black, Indigenous, people of color in the industry. So Capri Robinson, um, AJ Johnson, and a few other people in the industry, in June 2020, they founded an organization called Back to Black to celebrate Black bartenders and also teach them more about entrepreneurship and provide more support um, through fundraising and also pop-up events. Uh, Capri Robinson and Erica, Chess, Erica Christian, who is a local wine sommelier, um, or was a local wine sommelier, they, found, they founded Empowering the Diner, which aims to decolonize the food and beverage industry. And they do that through offering um, workshops and educational experiences led by Black and Indigenous people of color. And those uh, have been mostly held online. Focus on health was a 
wellness nonprofit founded by Lauren Paler. And she used the platform she already had and the platform of other people through partnerships via Instagram, like live videos and other like recordings online to showcase underrepresented, underrepresented voices in the community. Um, and then Allison Lane, someone that we are hoping to interview soon, founded Bartenders Against Racism, uh, working towards to, to address this more, system, more systemic inequalities in the industry. And she was also very active on the front lines of protests last year for the Black Lives Matter and was actually a part of the group that had to take refuge on Swan Street Row House, in a Swan Street Row House when they were surrounded by DC police during uh, an especially uh, tense uh, protest last year, last summer. So many bartenders did fundraisers for national and local nonprofits. And I've seen a lot of that personally extend online too. So that for me was good to see that like there is still support and there's still resources being shared um, across the industry and commu broader community, not just in DC. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Bob to talk about the next phase of our project. Awesome, thank you so much, Laura. And uh, we're super excited that we were able to have an extension of the project to really allow us to talk to more, uh, more contemporary bartenders. Um, as, um, as things keep evolving and things keep changing, there's more perspective, I think, looking back on the last year and seeing what people are doing now, um, particularly with activism. Um, and I think one of the things that we've seen is um, all throughout, um, people creating their own platforms, um, that if they're not getting um, the, you know, the attention towards the issues that they feel so important about and that need to be talked about, um, creating their own platforms together, sharing with, you know, other um, platforms that have wide visibility to get their message out. Um, and so they're really telling their own stories and telling both of the history and contemporary experiences for Black bartenders and uh, the issues in the industry that need to change. Um, so I think, you know, we've also for this extension are going back further and talking to uh, about the history of bars in Shaw in the 60s and 70s. You know, I think we wanted to know what it was like for bartenders now. Um, but one of uh, our president of Shaw, or executive director, um, excuse me, uh, board chair of Shaw Main Streets, Gretchen uh, Wharton was a longtime Shaw resident, born and grew up in Shaw. Um, and she said, you know, we went to, used to go to these bars in the 60s and 70s. We knew these bartenders that are no longer around and interviewing folks that were patrons of the bars um, to remember uh, the, the bartenders in the neighborhood, um, what the bars were like in the neighborhood is a really valuable thing to capture that um, history while we can too. Um, so that's sort of the next phase. And we have a, we have a little bit of, um, we have some clips involved with that, but I think we've gone a little bit long. So I wanted to stop now um, to see if there are questions from Jasper or from anyone else about you know, our topic or about the experiences that we had doing oral history. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Jasper right now. Thanks, Bob, and thanks to all of you. This presentation has been incredible. I know it's a little bit longer than we had originally slated for, but um, that's not a problem at all. It's amazing to hear all the different areas that the project has touched on. I think that, um, you know, it's great to be able to talk about how oral history can not only, you know, help us recover memories from the past, you know, documenting, you know, some of these histories that are untold, but also you know, that you all were able to pivot so quickly and so effectively um, when you, you know, found out that you had received the support from DCOHC last year to document these things that are happening right now in the Black bartending community in DC. So, you know, thank you all so much for your presentation, for sharing these great clips from your narrators. Um, one of the things that, um, you know, I usually like to try to get to at least briefly in each of these programs is a little bit about the process that you went through to collect the oral histories. How did you develop the project? You know, what approaches did you use to interview people? And I think one of the things, you know, and I'll keep this brief, um, you know, because I know we are running out of time. I want to see if anybody you know, who's still with us here has any questions, but um, I wanted to ask, um, because the, you know, group of people that you're interviewing are bartenders and are so accustomed to you know, sharing and listening and, you know, um, engaging with people. I just kind of got the impression, even from the clips that we listened to today, that there was no problem at all kind of drawing stories out from people. I think that's really unique, um, you know, for a lot of oral history projects where that can be like the biggest challenge. But as I thought about it, you know, sometimes I think that that can be like a benefit to the project. Sometimes, 
you know, might cause a little bit of difficulties. And I just wondered if any of you had any thoughts about, you know, what it was like to interview a group of people who are so extroverted and and able to share and kind of how that affected the project. Sure, I can start off with that one. Um, First of all, it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> like I said earlier, who doesn't want to sit down with a bartender and you know really have a conversation? I think bartenders they're great talkers, but they're great listeners too, right? They're you know they come in the hospitality industry and really paying attention to what their um, patron is saying. And so to be able to flip that and to um, hear from them, I think was a great privilege. You know, some of it was hard. You know, I, I come from a journalistic background and Laura, um, Alex and as well, and Laura in a production background where we have a really kind of agenda where there are things that we want to know about and really ask targeted questions. And oral history, I mean, we really learned was a little bit different. Like we're not in the driver's seat, it's the narrators. And so, you know, really um, delving back into their life, their childhood, you know, what really informed their decisions to become a bartender um, and things that totally unrelated to bartending. You know, I think a lot of issues came up about you know, issues of gentrification in DC, um, issues of, um, you know, systemic racism as well that, um, you know, connected to the industry, but also not. Um, and so uh, it was a really, you know, I, well, I wish we had more time with them. Bartenders are very busy people. And so often we would catch them right before they were going um, to their next gig. And so we were so thankful of the time that they would give, but we could have talked for hours um, because they were such good talkers. I know one of the little things Laura mentioned, and Laura, if you want to touch on this about how honest they were, um, you know, bartenders can be very diplomatic too, but you know, there's also during this time period, it, that really shifted and people talked about politics and what, you know, um, what drove them and what made them angry and, um, and what depressed them. Um, so I don't know, Laura, if you want to address that a little bit too. Yeah, sorry, there was a train going by. Um, I, especially as someone, like I have a production background, but I was fairly new, I guess, to interviewing in this capacity. And so I, at first was like, oh, I'm I'm going to have to like, make sure I hit every single point and like make sure to direct them back to here. But they really are good talkers. And it's especially because it's something they're passionate about. It was easy for them to just go. And so I just went along with them. Um, I, they, they were very, very candid and very honest about their feelings last year throughout the year, which I thought was very interesting and very brave of them being so open and honest with us because technically we're kind of strangers, <laughs> um, but it was, it was great to get to know them better. And I felt good that they could trust us with that information. Um, and yeah, that's, that's what I thought. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, I, I do want to just kind of, you know, say that, um, you know, if, you know, anybody who, you know, is remaining with us in the audience, if you have any questions, um, please do go ahead and put those in the Q&A, or you can use the raise hand feature, and you can feel free to ask your question at any time. Um, but I also wanted to, you know, just go back to the idea that you all are now in the second phase of the project. Um, you know, what are, what are the plans beyond that? I know that, uh, you know, there's kind of always this collecting impulse and this like desire to build up this archive to document these voices initially, but, you know, um, ultimately, you know, at least with the DCOHC, you know, our goal is to not only collect, but also to share these stories back with the community. And I'm wondering if you all have any plans for a public humanities project, be it digital and exhibit listening station, community events, anything like that? Sure, yeah, I, I can take that one. Um, I think you know, one of the things, um, because there is such a strong community of nonprofits and you've seen a lot of the, uh, the websites for these nonprofits in the chat um, that are doing this storytelling um, from the perspective of black bartenders, really wanting to connect our, you know, our interviews and transcripts, um, making those available for um, the community to tell those stories and to use that um, as a resource. Um, and I think for the platform of Shaw Main Streets, um, you know, has, which has a social media and digital presence as well, um, being able to map, you know, where those um, bars used to be. Um, you know, we worked with uh, Gretchen Wharton, um, uh, who had an amazing spreadsheet about all the bars that she remembered and her friends remembered going to, where they were. Alex is an expert on Shaw history as well and finding archival photos and images of, of these bars. Um, and being able to map them out, but match them with these clips so you can not only see where they were, see what they looked like, but hear what the experience of being in a bar was like, the description of what the bar 
was like um, and really recreate it in your, in your head. Um, you know, I think those are vanished places and I've lived in DC for 20 years and I went through the exercise of talking to a friend, you know, trying to remember some bars we went to 10 years ago and we couldn't quite remember where it was or what it you know, looked like and we had to talk about it together to kind of recreate that memory. And, um, and so that's one of the things that we were doing in this next phase of the project. Um, and we did have, a, we had a great interview with three um, folks, Gretchen Warden and two of her friends who grew up in Shaw uh, about what it was like going to those bars. And um, Gretchen had the great idea of doing that interview um, together so everyone could jog their memory. And I had to say it made it a very difficult transcript um, to, <laughs> to correct and to write because you had a lot of talk over, but it made it that much richer because people were fuel, you know, fueling on their memories and actually remembering very accurately um, by you know, uh, that group experience. Um, and we have a clip that we can play for that if we have a little time, but, um, um, or we can uh, do another question too. Uh, I think it'd be great to play the clip, actually, if you think this is a good time for it, Bob. Sure, sure. Yeah, this was one of my favorites, and I, it was a really fun interview for us to do. So let's, um, that's the Gretchen Wharton interview um, number one, if you want to play that. One. We're called After Hours. After Hours. Except, after, yeah. except that one of them, like the Chez Maurice on 9th Street, at 12 o'clock, we just lock the doors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and have our own private party. <laughs> right, right. Right, you couldn't right, do it right. because you couldn't sell liquor after, mm. after midnight. But if you locked the doors and it was called your own private party, it was cheers to us. Mm. Everybody in there felt like you knew everyone. You felt like family. Uh, a woman, you felt protected. A, a woman could go in by herself and feel perfectly comfortable because you knew right. exactly. somebody would look out for you. They would walk you to your, somebody to walk you to your car. And we're not talking about from the restaurant, but just, you know, somebody attending, they mm -hmm. would just make sure you got to your car safely. And, and you never know who'd walk in, Robert Hooks, uh, Red Fox, any of them, anybody might walk in there. Uh, mm -hmm. Judge Gladys, Harry Kelly, Gladys Knight. Any, anyone that might walk in there because it was on the map is one of the bars mm -hmm. in D.C. you had to go to. The black I don't want to say but, Right, there was a bartender there. Um, well, he was more than a bar. He was like a host. A man. And red. His, red. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. And Gladys Knight loved, Reds was so funny. I mean, he was so comical. Everybody loved him. Gladys Knight used to come in just to sit down and talk with him. <laughs> Everyone. He was He was one of the most loved bartenders in the world, in my, my, my personal opinion. And when, when faces yep. moved up, when faces opened up, he was the one that they begged to come and be, that he was really a host then, a host of faces. Right. And most people, a lot of people came, didn't care for, maybe didn't care for mm, some people up there, but they love Red. Mm. And so he, thought, so he, was, he was responsible for the popularity of faces, I think. Early I on. agree. I agree. He was just personable. He was funny. He could just say he could say and he could say things about you and to you that other people would get knocked in their head for saying. And people just wanted Red to say something <laughs> bad about him or comical or what you got on today or you look like this or you know, he was just one in a million. One in the that song one in a million. Yeah. yeah. Was red. He would say something. <laughs> I would say I'd say, Red, aren't you going to Sammy Jones funeral? No, I said, wow, he ain't coming to mind. <laughs> you know, he would and there's not one there's not one woman or man who didn't when they entered hug, hug Red or shake his hand. And I mean the, the men loved him as much as the women loved him. He was just he was just dynamic. But he did go to other bars, but mostly he I mean, you know, when he went to the other bars, he was like a celebrity. Mm. Everybody was glad to see him. Everybody was glad to see him. But he but but when he was with Shay Maurice, and when he was with Faces, he was there for the for the duration. I hate to dwell on Shay Maurice, but that was such an intricate part of our lives. Yeah, it um, was for me. An intricate part of it. What um, I was so hurt was, about uh, is when they when they renovated Shea Maurice, they knocked down the wall before I could get there to tell somebody, don't knock down the wall. Everybody who had been in there for so many years signed the wall in there. Yeah. And plus, we like to be tight. We didn't want a lot of space. We wanted to rub against each other. No, right. <laughs> was more inti intimate by being soon. You expand and make a place bigger. It's never the same. A little bit of a longer clip, but you know that was a super fun one to be a part of and listen to. And you saw the image of 1928 T uh, 9th Street, uh, which modern day uh, nightclub, I guess, um, was Secrets. 
Um, but that's where Shea Maurice originally was. And uh, the fact that, you know, you can recreate, uh, you can imagine what this bartender and manager reads was like by listening to them um, and, you know, really put a, a, put a face and a personality to the name. And um, yes. even, so his last name was Wiley, Reds Wiley. Thank you. And even at the end, you know, when they, they expanded the place and, you know, the response was, yeah, this wasn't the same. We liked the old place better. And I think we all have that experience of like not wanting change, like loving our old places. But I, you know, I think they, they really recreated what those small, wonderful bars and nightclubs were like on Ninth Street, U Street. And, um, you know, one, one last thing about that interview, one surprising thing that came, up, up, um, came about was, you know, I'd always assumed that most bartenders in these bars were men. And I don't know why I just assumed it, but I think because I hadn't read about uh, women bartenders. And I think that was a huge lesson to me of, you know, just because it's not in your his the history you've read, don't assume that that is true. And that's the history of black bartenders as well when those stories aren't told. And so when we were talking about it, they said, oh yeah, these were all women bartenders. They are mostly older women bartenders that were huge superstars and bartending was their uh, way of life and it was their profession. And they were just as popular as, you know, a man like Red's. And so that was, you know, an unexpected thing that just came out of the interview. I didn't ask the question, but it was something I learned that, you know, when you allow folks to talk, you, you get so much more. So, sorry, that was, um, like I said, a, a real fun one. And we're looking forward to continuing that part in our extension. Great. Thanks so much, Bob. And uh, thanks again to all of you for being a part of this panel. It's been so great to hear from you. Um, I just wondered... Um, you know, the last thing I, you know, would want to say is uh, you can either respond to this question or you can just give us like your final closing thoughts here, you know, now that you, have you know, kind of done this oral history project, um, you've started this second phase. I wonder if you have any like just kind of brief advice for anyone else who might be thinking about doing an oral history project with, you know, a professional community or with their kind of local neighborhood or geographic community. Do you have any advice for people starting oral history project? Yeah, I, you know, I think you know, doing your research, and I think Laura um, and I, you know, did a lot of research beforehand, and Laura did an amazing job of sort of tracing back, you know, who are the people that we need to talk to, and starting with that initial set, and then asking them, what, who should we talk to next, who should we, what questions should we ask, uh, because, you know, as we started building out interviews, a whole community started taking shape um, of how these communities interacted, uh, how everyone knew each other and in the diversity of the community too. And so I think really, um, you know, starting that initial research, but then letting um, them help guide, you know, who they think is important to talk to. Um, and that was really valuable to us. Great. Do you have anything to add to that, Laura? No, I just want to reinforce that it, it was a very inter interwoven community. Like everyone kind of knew each other or had worked somewhere where this person worked or who knew someone who knew this person. So just start with one and the rest will all fall into place. And I know, and I know Alex too has a lot of experience in this. Um, anything that you suggest, Alex? Yeah, no, I'd, I'd say that uh, uh, part of the, the really most rewarding uh, part of uh, projects like this is discovering voices that you didn't know about, you hadn't identified before. And you start casting your net out and, uh, and you know, getting leads uh, from folks in the community once you, you put it out there uh, that you're, you're doing research in this particular area. You know, you're introduced to folks that you didn't know, uh, that have perspectives that, uh, that uh, you didn't expect to find. And so go with uh, where those uh, uh, leads uh, you know, point you uh, because you don't know where you're going to find the real gems. Uh, so, and, uh, and, and also, you know, sometimes, you know, you can spend, spend an hour, you know, talking to an interview subject and it's, and it's just, you know, a minute or two that are really the, the nugget uh, that really makes that whole experience of, of talking to that person uh, pay off and really can add uh, incredible depth to your overall project. And the last thing I say, always talk to your bartender. Uh, there are a wealth of stories and information and please support your bartenders, particularly black bartenders in DC and their bars, um, particularly during this time. So it's a fun way to support. And, and come to Shaw, we'll see you in Shaw. Great, well, thank you all again, um, you know, for sharing these great stories, for, you know, being a part of this panel. Um, it's been incredible, um, you know, and I look forward to seeing how the project continues to develop. I know that, you know, the extension phase is in full swing. 
Um, so just a couple of final things. Um, Tracy will be putting a link um, to a survey in the chat. Um, I know we still have a few people who are on with us live. You know, hopefully we'll have some more people who um, you're able to access the recording afterwards. Uh, but if you can just fill out that survey, it's very brief. It helps us improve our programs. Um, we hope that you'll join Humanities DC for a live taping of the Self-Determined Podcast with Professor Danielle Boos. Information about that can be found on our website. Uh, we also have an upcoming Humanitini virtual program called Afro-Modernity in the Chocolate City, Go-Go's Diasporic Roots. Um, that also can be found on our website. And of course, next month's DC Oral History Collaborative Coffee Chat will feature the Hyrick House Museum's oral history project called Home Brood. So we have a little bit of a theme going for these <laughs> couple of months. Um, but thank you all um, and enjoy the just, just Jasper, can I interrupt for one second? I'm so sorry. One last thing I want to say is that the DC Oral History Collaborative was a huge wealth of knowledge and training. And so it trained us in the way to do um, uh, oral histories, which was different than what we sort of knew as interviewers and as storytellers. And so all the wealth of you know, training that you had and resources online are amazing. So thank you for that. Great. Um, yep, yeah, definitely. You know, glad that uh, the supporting materials, the workshops and everything were, you know, helpful. Uh, and, uh, you know, thank you for kind of sharing back your experience to people who will hopefully be able to put together some oral history projects of their own. But thanks again. Um, and I hope that you all have a great weekend. You too. Cheers. All right. Thank you. Bye.